Yep, John 11, 34, page 761 in the Church Bible. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up to the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Is he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus sat among those reclining at the table. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this for the perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who came, comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Well, on Sunday mornings, we've been working our way through John's Gospel. Uh, last week we looked at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So this week we're really looking at the aftermath of that um, miraculous sign. Here in chapter 12 it's been read to us by Pascal and I've, I've uh, entitled the message this morning Genuine Faith. What is genuine faith? And how do we know that how do we know when we have it? Have you ever wondered about that? You know, as you as you go through the gospel account, you see many people expressing a, apparently a faith or a commitment to Jesus Christ, but it soon evaporated when the hard times came. And uh, the crowds that welcomed him into Jerusalem in chapter 12 were the same crowd that six days later were calling for his death. And, and so, you know, the, the question arises, what is genuine faith? What is the kind of faith that, in Christ that takes us through difficult times? Well, I think part of the answer is found in our passage this morning. Genuine faith is faith that looks to Jesus Christ and trusts the benefits of his death for our salvation. You see, it may be that we look to Jesus Christ for many things. 
to make our relationships work, to make our circumstances work. But ultimately, genuine faith looks to Jesus Christ and to the benefits of his death for our salvation. So that brings us to our passage this morning. And uh, if, you, um, if you can follow along with your Bibles open, we have Bibles available for you to use if you wish. And uh, we'll look at this passage together and trust the Lord will minister his grace to us. Well, the raising of Lazarus from the dead certainly had an effect. And that wouldn't be hard to uh, imagine, would it? That would have a startling effect on the people that witnessed it and on the people that heard about it and the people that knew about it and the people that saw Lazarus walking around. They had attended his funeral and there he was walking among them. A dramatic effect. And such was the effect that it aroused strong support for Jesus and strong opposition against Jesus. Support from Jesus from the people who wanted to see more of this kind of thing and opposition from the leaders who were concerned that they were losing their constituency to the prophet from Galilee. And can anything good come from Galilee? So Jesus withdrew again into the desert. You see that in uh, the end of chapter 10 and verse 54 and 55. He could no longer move publicly among the Jews and so he withdrew to a desert region with his disciples. However, another Passover was due. Another Passover was due and the crowds were on the lookout for Jesus. Now, we're told in chapter 12, verse 1, that there was six days before the Passover. A week before Passover, the pilgrims had to come and spend a week purifying themselves before the Passover began. So in this uh, six-day uh, six period or this week before the Passover, the city was already filling up with people preparing themselves for the Passover festivities that would begin in six days' time. And because the raising of Lazarus had just occurred two miles down the road, the Passover crowd, as they came into the city, were being told by those who were there in chapter 11 about what had happened. And Jesus was known to be in the vicinity, and so the expectation was growing that perhaps he would appear during Passover time. So they were on the lookout for Jesus, but so were his enemies. See in verse 57, the last verse in chapter 11, but the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. So not only was there a Passover during six days, but the sisters Mary and Martha had extended Jesus another deadly invitation. See, the first deadly invitation there in the previous chapter was come, leave the sanctuary of your desert refuge and come back to the city that hates you. And now he, he, he raised Lazarus from the dead and went back to his desert refuge and now the sisters are saying, come back, this time to a dinner party to be held in your honour here in Bethany. And Lazarus would also be present. But you see, Passover was only six days away. And Passover, as you know, is a festival of sacrifice, a festival of messianic expectation and deliverance in a time of Roman tension in the city of Jerusalem. And the presence of Jesus in Jerusalem at this time, so soon after raising Lazarus from the dead, could set off an explosive riot among the people. Such were the strength of feeling running both for and against him. The other significance of that little phrase at the beginning of chapter 12, it was six days before Passover, is that as we uh, move into the account, we realize that this Passover would coincide with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 
six days before Passover meant that as Jesus responds to this invitation to attend this dinner party, he does so knowing he has only six days left to live. In six days, he will be hanging on his cross. His death was only six days away. His earthly ministry was all but over. He would spend these six days in Jerusalem, hidden, out of sight, in an upper room, ministering and teaching primarily to his disciples. Now, at this stage of his three-year ministry, as it draws to a close, does anyone have genuine faith? Anyone who's been associated with Jesus in any way over this three-year period, with six days left to go, does anyone have genuine faith? Or are they only following Jesus for the miracles? Well, verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Uh, during the dinner party, Mary anointed his feet with nard and the reclining that we're told about is a reclining where you lean with one elbow towards the food and you're, you're sitting on the floor and your feet out behind you. It's very easy for someone to come up and anoint your feet. So here at the dinner party, Mary anoints his feet with nard, and, and, and this action has already been signaled for us in chapter 11, verse 2, where we're told that this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So in 11.2, you see, we're being told about an action that hasn't yet taken place, and it, it would appear that the, the original readers of John knew all about what Mary had done, and so when Mary is mentioned in chapter 11, it's like John saying to his readers, yes, that's right, this is the one whom you know about who poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, and now we come to chapter 12, and, and, and here is Mary's action being described. Now, she used about 300 grams of nard. That's a very large amount. Usually when we, uh, we, us blokes, use aftershave or you ladies use perfume, it's just a little bit behind the ear, just a few drops splashed on the face. I trust you do that. <laughs> so, for the sake of those you live with. So, you know, that, so nard was like that, you see. Just, and it was so powerful in its fragrance, just, just a little drop was enough to, to fill the room. And, and uh, Mary empties the whole lot onto Jesus. Pulls the whole lot out. Nothing is held back. All of it poured out on Jesus. And, uh, and being such a large amount, it probably covered more than his feet. She perhaps began with his head and and, and ended up with his feet. And John makes mention of the feet here. Other passages make mention of the head being anointed. John makes mention here of the feet, particularly because in chapter 13, there will be the washing of the disciples' feet. Now, what is nard? Well, nard is, a, is an extract of the root of a plant grown in India. And India is a long way from Palestine, so you can see that the extraction of this nard and the transportation of it to Palestine would make it a rare and expensive product and one to be used sparingly, but not in this case. She poured it all out on him. And, and what's even more remarkable for the people in the room is you see that you wouldn't, you wouldn't use such an expensive product on feet. Usually when people came to your house for a meal in those days, you would wash their feet with water. You'd provide water for the washing of their feet. Remember that? Jesus rebuked a Pharisee once for not providing water for the washing of his feet. And you wouldn't use nard on feet. And here she uses it all up. It was a cause for surprise and comment. And uh, <clears throat> the surprise was for everybody. The comment was for Judas. 
Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. It's worth a year's wages. Well, um, how much do you earn in a year? Don't answer that. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. See, if you think about that, that's what it was worth, about a year's wages. Well, what's the average wage? Well, it, that's about what this was worth in those terms. You see, it was, it was enough for a deposit on a house. That's how expensive it was. Well, perhaps not an Auckland house. You get the idea. You see, very, very expensive. Poured out on his feet, no less. And uh, the objection by Judas and Jesus' response to the objection both point to the death of Jesus. Verse 7. Leave her alone, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. His death is only six days away. And Jesus makes it very clear that this action by Mary is on account of his impending death. And burial. Notice in verse 4 that Judas is identified as the one who would soon betray him. So you see, the, the Pharisees were looking for him. The end of verse end of chapter eleven, that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it. Someone should dob him in. They didn't know where he was, he was in hiding. They needed someone to dob him in. And in chapter twelve, verse four, we're told that Judas Iscariot was going to do the job and betray him to his enemies. So, you see, even in the relative safety of the house of Bethany, with people that loved him dearly, Jesus was in the presence of his enemies as events were swirling around him, carrying him to his inevitable death. Now, verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Now, here you're beginning to get an understanding of what Mary was doing. You see, it, when someone dies, in Palestine in those days, you anoint the body for burial. And it's not just the feet, you see, it's the whole body. And you might well use up a whole jar of nard of someone you, you loved greatly or someone who was a very prominent person, perhaps, and you would anoint the whole body with nard. So there we see... It's like Mary knew that Jesus was going to die. And she wasn't sure if she was going to be around to anoint his body when that time came. So she was going to do it now. In anticipation of that time. She was going to do it now when she had access to him. And relative freedom to do it. She was going to anoint his body now for his imminent burial. Well, how did Mary know? How did Mary know of Christ's impending death? Did she know because Jesus had told her in a quiet moment of teaching or of talking or of disclosure? Was Jesus able to tell her because of her faith in him and her love for him? We don't know except that we do know that Jesus did have a close relationship with Mary, Martha and Lazarus and Jesus makes it very clear that Mary was doing this on account of his impending burial. So you see now this act is an act of extraordinary devotion and sacrifice. Now as Judas saw it, you could waste all this ointment on the feet of Jesus or you could sell it, a year's wages, and give all that money to the poor. Now he had his own motives for seeking that alternative but nevertheless, as he expressed it, that was an alternative. You could have given it to the poor. Instead of pouring it out in devotion and sacrifice, wasting it, if you like, on the feet of one man. Verse 8, 
Jesus continues his response to Judas. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Judas had raised the issue of this should have been given to the poor. So Jesus picks up on that in verse 8. And in verse 8 there, Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 15. And in your church Bibles, that's page 137. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. And here in uh, this chapter, the people of Israel are being given instructions by God on how to care for, among other things, the poor in the land. So in Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, God says to the people, there will always be poor in the land. Therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. You see, Jesus is quoting from the first part of that verse because Judas had used the second half of that verse to rebuke Mary. Picking up on Deuteronomy 15.11, second half of that verse, Judas thought he had solid biblical grounds for his rebuke. Well, Jesus picks up on the first part of that verse, there will always be poor people in the land, and he says in chapter 12, Verse 8, you will always have the poor among you. But then he adds, you will not always have me. You see, in Deuteronomy 15, the people have been instructed to be generous and open-hearted to the poor in their midst. Now, isn't that exactly what Mary was doing? She was being generous and open-hearted. And Judas was saying, that's fine, but you should have done it for the poor. Jesus applies that verse to himself. Jesus is the poor man in the land. Jesus is the poor man in their midst. Mary has done exactly what the scriptures commanded her, and upon the poor man, she has open-hearted and generously and sacrificially poured out her provision for the poor man. Jesus is the poor man that will soon be taken from them. He is the poor man who will soon be subject to injustice, torture, and murder. Jesus is thus a worthy recipient of the nard. Judas, it was in fact given to the poor. Does God have a special place in his heart for the poor? Does God have a special place in his heart for the poor? Well, he does make special provision for them in the Old Testament laws. But the special place in God's heart is for his son, the poor man of redemptive history. And that special place in God's heart extends to all those united to his son by faith. You see, our life of commitment and faith will render us poor in the eyes of the world yet rich in the things of heaven and eternity. Remember what we were told in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, page 820. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Jesus Christ, the poor man of redemptive history, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus Christ, who came to us as the poor man, the man who was worthy of all those promises and blessings that God gave to the poor in the Old Testament, all of them, focused on Jesus Christ as the poor man of redemptive history and through his poverty, embracing his poverty, embracing his poverty in genuine faith, you see, then the riches and the glories of heaven become ours. 
And so his gospel comes to us in the poverty of our sin and rebellion and offers us a share of the riches and honour he now enjoys in the presence of the Father. Well, while all this was going on, outside the house the crowds were gathering and his enemies were plotting. Verse 9, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Verse 12, the next day. So the next day after the dinner party, Jesus decided to leave Bethany and enter Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He left the relative safety of the house in Bethany and he headed to the city of his death. Now the crowds knew that he was in Bethany and they were waiting for him to come out and join the Passover in Jerusalem. In fact, the ones who had witnessed the raising of Lazarus spread the word among the Passover crowd and you can imagine it going around the city like wildfire. He's coming. He's coming. At last, he's coming. You know, they've been waiting for him. He's coming. You see, he's, he's, he's only a mile away. He's heading. So they all rushed out to meet him as he drew near the city, and they took up palm branches as they went out to meet them. And, and uh, it was traditional that palm branches would be waved by pilgrims as they enter the city for Passover. And their cries in verse 13 come from the psalms that were sung at Passover time, particularly from Psalm 118, which we began the service with this morning. And the focus of these praises were traditionally directed towards the city and to the temple and to the pilgrims who came to Passover in the name of the Lord, but here they're directed towards Jesus as King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus' identity as King is further strengthened by his riding in on a donkey. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your King is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, it was only two miles from Bethany to Jerusalem. Jesus was a walker. He spent three years walking everywhere. Many times he had walked from Bethany to Jerusalem. So why a donkey? Why this time a donkey? This was his last time. This was the last time he'd make that trip through the gates of Jerusalem into the city that kills the prophets. And he came on a donkey. He came on a donkey in order to fulfill the scriptures that had been written about him. You see, the adulation of the crowds toward Jesus was a great frustration and concern to the Pharisees. Any talk by the crowds at Passover in Jerusalem about a king other than their Roman overlords was to invite all kinds of reaction and retribution. But see, they need not have been concerned as the passage from Zechariah 9 makes clear, and this is where that uh, quote comes from in verse 15. It comes from Zechariah chapter 9, or page 672. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. You see, he does not come on a war horse. This king comes on a donkey, an animal of gentleness and peace. He comes to make peace, not war. He comes to proclaim peace to the nations, this poor man. But his enemies were afraid for themselves. 
They were wanting to do away with Jesus and Lazarus on the quiet. But Jesus' loud and visible entry into the city made that impossible. You see it in verse 19? So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. See, and the Pharisees spoke more than they realized, didn't they? The whole world has gone after him. Much like Caiaphas had in chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 49, one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. That one poor man die for the nation. Let's find a poor man that we can put to death. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, bringing them together to make them one. And now the Pharisee said in chapter 12, verse 19, see, the whole world has gone after him. In their enmity, they were shown to be players in God's great plan for the ages. Indeed, the whole world will go after him because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever in the whole world put their faith in him would not perish but have eternal life. And as Zechariah had said in the passage we read, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. How could it be that this poor man who in six days' time would die on a Roman cross could be a king whose rule would extend to the ends of the earth. The whole world has gone after him. The whole world would indeed be made subject to the rule of this king, this donkey rider, this poor man who became poor for our sake. So in, in a few days' time when he stands before Pilate and he speaks of his kingship before Pilate, it's a kingship that Pilate cannot understand. It's not a kingship of this world. It's a kingship of an eternal kingdom with immense riches of an eternal kingdom that are going to belong to this poor man. This king who rode into the city on a donkey hailed by the crowds would in a few days leave the city carrying a cross of cruel execution. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the, the, the shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Well, what is genuine faith? The crowds were focused on the miracles. They wanted to see more of Jesus because they wanted to see more of the miracles. Their faith was in his miraculous powers. For on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. On account of the raising of Lazarus, you see in verse 11, they were putting their faith in Jesus. They are putting their faith in Jesus on account of the miraculous signs. Now, you see in this passage the powerful contrast between that faith and the faith of Mary. In her faith, she was focused on his death. She, hers was not a faith that was focused on his miraculous powers. Hers was not a faith that was focused on what Jesus could do for her. Hers was a faith that was focused on Jesus' death. When she had the opportunity to show love and faith and devotion to Jesus, it was in terms of his death. Genuine faith is a faith that focuses on the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus for our sake. And it was the death of Jesus that drew her to Jesus in love and commitment and costly sacrifice. So genuine faith, you see, is faith that trusts in the death of Jesus Christ for our life, faith that takes seriously our sin, takes seriously the death of Christ for our sin. The promise is that all who confess their sin will be forgiven. That indeed is the greatest riches of all eternity that could be ours in Jesus Christ. The man who was rich became poor, that we who are poor might be made rich, rich in forgiveness, rich in grace, rich in love, rich in mercy, that we might spend the whole of eternity in the presence of one who loved us so much. Genuine faith is ours this morning, beloved, as we turn our hearts again to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.
Father God, thank you for these, these lessons that you teach us from your word. We thank you, Father, that the whole of your scriptures speak with one voice. They speak to us of our Lord and Saviour. Every story whispers his name. And yet in these gospel stories, that whisper becomes a shout. A shout that will one day be heard around the world from sea to sea. A shout that Jesus Christ is King. A shout that his rule overcomes all other rules. His rule is for eternity. And Father God, we thank you that on his way to obtaining our salvation, Jesus Christ was willing to die in our place and take the punishment that we deserved, that through the merits of his sacrifice, of his death, of his shed blood, we might know his forgiveness, the riches of his grace and mercy toward us. And so, Father God, our prayer this morning, as not one person would leave this building, this morning, who has not taken this opportunity to again confess their sins to you and ask you to forgive them. In the name of our Lord Jesus. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.